Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Property Buyer and Sellers Podcast. Here we are once again talking about all things property to smooth your property journey, whatever the future holds for you and your home, be it one that you're living in right now, you'd like to live in. Today, we're going to talk about that critical move, selling your own house and buying another. But before we get into that, as usual, we're going into the headlines and telling you what's going on in the market. So the first thing that's come up is in the Times and the Telegraph. And this is an interesting one, one we've been reporting on this week in our live broadcasts, and that is competition returns as lenders reduce mortgage rates. Now, it seems counterintuitive, doesn't it, that here we are in a market where interest rates have just gone up, literally just gone up. And yet the news is at least 13 lenders out of 82 are set to reduce mortgage rates, signaling easing pressure on homeowners as competition returns to the market. Now, to give you an example of that, and by the way, this is not mortgage advice. We're not qualified to give it. Please seek advice from an independent financial advisor if you need it. Halifax and NatWest are among the lenders reducing rates by up to 0.71% and 0.65% respectively. HSBC, Nationwide and TSB have already cut rates this week after the latest data on inflation was better than expected, despite the Bank of England raising the interest rate for a 14th successive time last week. David Hollingworth of LNC Mortgages said, we're seeing the beginnings of a rates war. There is tougher competition in the market with more lenders coming forward to announce cuts on rates to some of their fixed rate deals, he said. It certainly looks that mortgage rates have turned a corner. Well, it certainly looks that way, doesn't it? And it is counterintuitive when you see the headline rates going up and then the actual rates with mortgage lenders going down with fixed rates. And that's because of a thing called swap rates. And these are the rates that are predicted by the money markets to be where they are in two, five or 10 years time. And it's those swap rates that the lenders use to hedge against and therefore rely on. So if there's a swap rate ahead, which is lower than the current rate, then that can affect your fixed rate loan. Of course, if you're on a variable or tracker rate, then you will just track, track the base rate. But if you're on a fixed rate, then it's uh, certainly interesting to see that the rates that you can achieve might surprise you. Now on to rental. No fault evictions are at a six year high. Uh, the ministry, and this is in The Guardian, I should add, the Ministry of Justice has just released the figures saying that 7,491 no fault eviction claims were brought before courts in April and June, and that's up 35% year on year and the highest number since 2017. The same period saw 2,228 no fault evictions carried out using bailiffs, up 41% year on year. Polly Nate, chief executive of Shelter, said the government must get rid of no-fault evictions, which have made the prospect of a stable home little more than a fantasy for England's 11 million private renters. While well, Dan Wilson Craw from Generation Rent said renters are bearing the brunt of the cost of living crisis, with record numbers being evicted for rent arrears and increasing numbers being evicted so landlords can sell up or raise the rent. Well, that's a predictable headline from The Guardian. Of course, it doesn't show the other side of the coin, which is landlords that are struggling to make repayments on loans that have trebled or quadrupled in the past few months. And therefore, even with rent rises, they're unable in many cases, if they're on a 75% mortgage, uh, actually to make those payments, even given the rent increases that they might need. So therefore, we agree. It is tough on tenants. It's really tough on tenants. But one of the reasons it's tough on tenants is because landlords' expenses are much higher. Coupled with that, you've got the threat of Section 21 no-fault evictions going under the Renters Reform Act and tax disincentives for landlords put in place by this government. It's hardly surprising that the level of rental stock in the UK is falling. And whilst it's falling, the demand is remaining the same or increasing, meaning that people are now in a position where they can't find homes to rent. And that is going to be the crisis of the future, in my view. So watch this space. We'll keep reporting on that. But certainly as far as we're concerned, we think there are incentives needed to keep landlords in the market. And just bullying them by removing Section 21 won't change their plans. They're not making these plans because of the Section 21 specifically. They're generally making these plans because they're seeing a sector where they could make a profit and they no longer can. Number of sellers reducing their asking prices by over 5% has doubled. And this is a study by Zoopla. And it says that across the UK this summer, prices by of sellers reducing their price for their home by more than 5% has doubled across much of the UK. The Southeast has also seen an 8% drop in the four weeks leading up to 23rd July. 
which is almost double the 4.4% average over the last five years. High increases have been recorded in the east of England, where the number jumped from 4 to 7.3% in the southwest, where the number increased from 36 to 6.3%. A drop of 3.5% was seen in Greater London, uh, followed by falls of 3.3% in the southwest of England and Wales. Well, of course, seller asking prices aren't the only determinant of where prices were or where they are. One of the big problems, as I mentioned before, is that many agents are struggling for new stock and where they're struggling to obtain new instructions to sell, what they're doing is pricing those properties optimistically as the market is still where it was a year ago. And it's not. Prices have fallen off a bit. And therefore, if you take an agent that's desperate for a sale and they're still valuing at last year's prices, and then how do they get stock? Well, many of them disingenuously will actually try and lie about the price. Yes, shock horror. What they'll tell you is that the property is worth, for instance, 600,000, when in fact it's worth 500,000. And what happens is they then gain your instructions, you sign up to their very long contracts, and then after a few weeks of no viewings, they ask you to reduce the price. It's a very common trick and one that you should watch out for. Sometimes the agents telling you the lower figure are just telling you the truth. So watch out for that and make sure you do your research. But we're coming on to all that in a moment. Uh, campaigners are calling for reforms to protect historic pubs. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, many of you would have seen the Crooked House pub uh, in Staffordshire was um, ravaged by fire. And it's very sad. Just after, coincidentally, a property developer bought it. And it is wrong. Um, and I do think that they do need to legislate against this. But the problem is that the uh, legislation doesn't have teeth. I'll give you another example of that. Uh, and that is that in order to, if you have a tree that you knock down, and you're a builder, you, you get a fine of £20,000. Well, imagine you've got a site which is full of protected trees. You might have 10 trees. You know, that £20,000 fine, if those trees accidentally fell down, a bulldozer ran into them, then the builder would have to pay 20000 per tree. It's just not enough to put them off buying that land and destroying those trees. Those trees are protected and deserve to stay protected, in my view, and that would mean making that fine much, much higher. Um, so, yeah, that's just a view there. Anyway, welcome back to the article about what we're here for today. And that is when you're buying and selling your house, what should you be doing and when? Now, first of all, what I would say is if you're a second timer or a first timer, assessing your finances is so critical in this business. A lot of people go in and they assume that the rates are perhaps what they were the last time they checked or that their mortgage capability is what it was the last time they checked. And frankly, everything has changed. Uh, and therefore, you need to approach a financial advisor, preferably an independent one. Why an independent financial advisor and not your bank? I'll tell you why. Because your bank will tell you what your bank's deal is and only what your bank's deal is. An independent financial advisor has access to the whole of the market, all of the lenders, and often some very clever software which will hunt lenders across the UK and work out what the best deal for you is in your circumstances. And that's the key thing because circumstances differ from client to client. Sometimes self-employed people are particularly liked by one lender and particularly disliked by another lender. Therefore, you can find yourself a much better deal by shopping around. And an independent financial advisor can do that for you. So number one is budget. Work out what you've got. How do you work out what you've got? Well, number one would be because we're talking about a buyer that is also a seller, obtain a valuation. Obtaining valuations is free. All estate agents will come around and give you a no obligation, free valuation. Talk about your house value and then you can make a determination as to whether the value that they're quoting seems reasonable given the difficult market that we're in. As I've already said, this is not as easy as it might seem. What you need to do is take a pragmatic approach to this. Try and Decathect, that means to detach yourself emotionally from the situation. Nice word that, isn't it? One of my clients put that to me the other day, and I thought it was a, a lovely way of describing detaching yourself emotionally from the process. Well, what I mean by that is your agents that come around and value your house, first of all, work out which ones you want around to your house. Look at who is a big hitter, heavy hitter on social media. What independent agents do you have in your area? And the reason independent agents make such a difference is because they're the ones that are in the local area that have been there for years. They understand your patch. They know exactly what price you're likely to achieve. 
and most of them have a reputation that's built on trust and honesty and won't overvalue your house and therefore you'll get a much more realistic picture of what you might be worth and this is critical because if you get a misleading picture of what your house is worth all the other decisions you make will be wrong based on the first decision which is relying on the value which is not there so once you've well, I would say get three valuations from three competing estate agents it depends on how you feel about it maybe you're confident in a particular agent in your area or you've used them before um, but it might be worth your while getting different opinions and we would always say use three agents to value your home once you've had those valuations have a look around what I would next do is I would dial your postcode into Rightmove or Zoopla and when you put your postcode in and then search for properties similar to your own, include sold subject to contract properties. And what that will do is it will bring up a list in your area. If nothing comes up, then expand the search out by a quarter of a mile and you'll find that things start to drop in. And then ask yourself, honestly, are these houses better than yours or worse than yours? And what is their current status? So, for instance, a property that's available and is worse than yours and at a higher price if it's been available for a considerable length of time, doesn't really prove anything. In other words, there you are looking at a house that someone's valued, potentially overvalued, and it doesn't prove that it's necessarily worth that price. Having said that, of course, buyers will be looking at what you're looking at right now, and that is that list of properties. How will your one make an impact amongst this list if you're in this price range? And if the answer is, well, it won't because they're all semi-detached and you're terraced, uh, then you have to be realistic and say, well, I've got an extra bedroom, therefore I can compete or I don't. And these ones have more to offer, therefore I can't compete. I need to come down a price range and then search a lower price range and see how your house would or flat would indeed slot into that particular group of properties. And if the answer is favorably, then you know you're getting towards the right sort of price range. Now, having determined what your home is worth, you then need to think about the financial advice because that will tell you what equity you have. And the more equity you have, the more doable the move will be, the easier it will be to make the transition from where you are to where you want to be. Now, uh, research and market analysis comes into this. Of course, we've mentioned market analysis in terms of looking on right move. Um, but really, you should look at other things, too, such as net house prices. That's nethouseprices.com. There you can dial in your postcode and you can look at all the sales in your road. Any good estate agent, however, will already have sent you a list of comparables or properties that are on the market and properties that are sold already, giving you some sort of idea. Once you've done that and your financial advisor says that the move is doable for you and that you can afford to do what you wish to do, be it upsize, downsize or sideways size, if you will. And by sideways size, I mean, take the value of your house at, say, half a million and use that same equity to move to a new area. Um, then you can start the actual research of the new areas. How do you find new areas? Well, first of all, you've got to decide where you want to live, of course. And then having found an area that you want to live in, is it affordable to you? Because we all aspire to something more than we've already got. And the question is, is the area you're moving to, and this is where you've got to be realistic, folks, is, is it a better area in terms of are the prices higher? And if the prices are higher, then you have to accept if you're making a sideways move, that you will get less for your money. And this may, may be okay, especially if you're downsizing, but often it's a struggle because people are looking to move two ways. More often than not, people are looking to move because their family has expanded, so they need something bigger, but also they want to get to an inverted commas better area. And when I say inverted commas better, I mean, it might be that another area has better schooling. This is a very typical motivation for a move. But those better schooling areas, because the schools are better, i.e. they're more highly ranked by Ofsted, or there are grammar schools, you'll find that those areas' prices reflect the fact those schools are better. So then the question is, can you afford to make what is effectively a double jump? And by double jump, I mean your house in that area would be more expensive, and then on top of that, you require more accommodation as well. You see the problem. And then from there, what do you do about it? Well, maybe you compromise a bit. If you're living in a semi-detached house with a garage at the moment, maybe you consider terrace in the new areas and you'll find that the prices might be more similar. There are always ways to make the move if you're determined to make it. The question is whether you're prepared to accept the compromise, but do bear in mind that house buying is always about compromise. No one is going to get everything they want. We value, we're retained by people to go and buy houses for them. And I can tell you now that it doesn't matter if you're spending half a million pounds 
or £3.5 million, there will always be shortcomings in any house that you're looking at. Something that you want, desire, don't want, would rather wasn't there. Uh, this is the nature of house buying and selling. So study the area that you're looking to move to, see if those houses are available. But my advice would be, if you can see that the move is viable, and by viable, I mean, A, you've got the funds, B, you like the area that you're looking at and what it's showing you in terms of affordability, according to what your mortgage broker's advice has told you and your estate agencies have told you your house is worth. And be very, very careful about that latter one. Remember, some estate agencies are overvaluing and causing people huge problems when it comes to trying to secure properties in new areas. Now, having found the area or having not found the area is a crucial thing. Let's say that you go to the area and you find that it's just not affordable. It's not doable. What can you do about it? Two things. Lower your sights or other areas. There are two things you can do that won't cost you. There is a third option, of course, and that is more money. But for most of us, the more money option isn't there. And that's why I say lower your sights or other areas. And this comes down to those compromises over perhaps looking at a detached, a semi-detached house rather than detached, a terrace rather than semi-detached, um, an end of terrace rather than semi-detached, for instance, is another option. Maybe a bedroom less, maybe a road that's slightly less desirable, but still provides what you need. And if all those things don't work, then other areas. And what you can do in Rightmove and Zoopla is you can do a search of a quarter of a mile around the area that you wanted to live in. How do you get to the area you want to live in? Well, first thing is go to the road you really want to live in. Find out the name of the road that you like the best. Once you've found the name of the road that you like the best, put a random door number into your search into Google. So let's say you like Christian Fields. Put in number 30 Christian Fields and hit search. What you'll find is that the postcode will come up in full. Now search that postcode in Rightmove or Zoopla. By doing that, you're centering your search on that area and that street and potentially a very small part of that street only. And then if nothing comes up or even if something comes up, but you can't find what you want, then expand that search by a quarter of a mile. And what you're doing is you're centering that search like a pin dropped on a map and then the circle comes out by a quarter of a mile and then you'll see more properties drop in. And if that works, then great. And if it doesn't, then the next stage is to enhance that search out by a half a mile. Still not working? Not to worry. Your next option, lower your sights. You're looking for detached houses. Let's include semis now. Still not working? Put terraced in as well. Take out that requirement for a garage. Consider something that needs more work. You know, these are all things you can do to try and make the move doable. Now, having found the area now, having really drilled down into the areas that we like, the next thing that I always suggest, especially if you're not familiar with an area, is take time to go there and be there. And what I mean by that is that second timers, normally it's a really important move for you. And what you need to do is make sure that you feel that you will integrate into that community and feel comfortable. Most of us feel comfortable in the communities we're in. Will we feel as comfortable or more in a new community? And you only know that by going there. So my suggestion is do the things that you would normally do in the new area. If it's an area that's a way away from where you are, perhaps take a weekend break down there. Go to the local supermarket, the local pub, the local coffee shop, the local gym, whatever it is that really makes up your usual or normal routine. How do you feel about the people around you? How do you feel about the area? Does it feel comfortable? Is it as quiet as you expected? Are there issues? You know, is it busy in the mornings? What do you really think now you're kind of living it? And bear in mind, when you go for a short break somewhere, it's always going to appear nicer because, of course, you've got that holiday sense. You're not working. Uh, there's no stress of the day-to-day -day living. So it can be the case that you can get rose-colored glasses by a short look. And this is why often people going down the coast will be on holiday, carefree, having a lovely week, and they'll end up buying there and find that the reality is quite different and end up moving back to where they came from originally. So it's really important that you, in a sense, live the area that you wish to move to. Okay, so what we've done here, we've obtained a valuation. We've now found out what the money is. We've looked at the area we want to move to. What is next? The next thing is to sell our own home. Why? Because if we look to buy before we sell, this will create issues. I'll give you the biggest example of that. Let's say you're moving to Brighton and you see a place and you absolutely love it. The problem is for most of us that it's not just about the money. The move is an emotional one. And the emotive nature of moving 
will make you want that property. And once your partner sees themselves in that garden and perhaps your children in that garden, having a barbecue and enjoying the space in this beautiful new area with this idyllic lifestyle, you're really sunk into it and you really want it. And emotionally, that can be hard. Now, because you haven't sold your property, your negotiating position, if you have to sell in order to buy, is compromised. Any good agent will make sure that you go at least to the asking price, possibly beyond, given that you're not in a strong negotiating position. This is not good. This is not ideal. So where does it leave you? Well, imagine this. You make an offer on the property. The agent comes back to you and says, I'm sorry, the offer's too low. You go up to the asking price. I'm sorry, you need a bit more and we might be there. You go up to £10,000 over the asking price because you've already moved in mentally into the house. The agent will speak to their vendor client, the seller, and say, look, good news. I've got you 10000 over the asking price. But here's the thing. This particular client hasn't sold their own home. Therefore, we would suggest that you tell them that the offer is accepted. However, you will leave the property on the market until they secure the chain from the bottom. In other words, sell their own property to someone that's in a position to buy it. Now, what have we done here? First of all, we've paid £10,000 more than the asking price for the one we're buying, probably over what we would have paid were we in a better negotiating position. How do we change that? Well, let's reverse that situation around. Imagine this. You've put your house on the market, having found the area you want to move to and waited for a buyer to come along. When the buyer comes along, you're honest or your agent should be honest with that buyer and say, look, cards on the table. My client hasn't found yet. You'll have to wait while they go out and look. This is quite normal. 90% of the market doesn't have anywhere else to go. So don't feel that it's something that you can't do. Just lay the cards on the table. We're moving to another area. We're committed to the move. However, we haven't found a house because we need a buyer first of all. Buyers will understand that because most of us are in that situation. Now, imagine you now obtain an offer. That offer might be wherever it is, at the asking price, below or above, whatever, and that person's in a position to move. Now, you go out and look at that house, that dream family home. And that dream family home now is on the market with an agent, and that agent is seeming to treat you a little bit more attentively because they know that you can move their client, and this changes everything. Now imagine you make an offer on that property. How do you make an offer without it seeming like you're being insulting to the client? Well, here's a good strategy. Imagine that your house was on the market for 500,000 and you achieve 490,000. What about we go to that seller and we say, look, we love your house. We really want to buy it. But here's the thing. We've received 10,000 pounds less on the house that we're selling than we anticipated we would get. And it's not that we're arguing that the price of your home is wrong. We think it's beautiful and worth every penny you're asking. However, we do have a buyer, but they've actually offered less due to a tougher market. Now, whilst we're not arguing about the price of your one being wrong, this is real. We can really move you. And you'd be surprised how often that strategy can be a lever for ending up agreeing a deal with a client. So number one, make sure you're under offer before you start negotiating. Now, that changes things. Why does it change things? Well, because now you as a seller haven't had the reverse problem. And the reverse problem is this. You have found the property you love. They're leaving it on the market. And you're now under huge pressure to sell your own. What does that mean? It means you're likely to take a lower offer. This is probably not in your interest, but you'll probably do it in order to get to the home that you love because the emotive nature of home buying means that you really want to get to your new place. So don't do it. Get yours under offer first, and it will make all the difference. Now, in terms of selling yours, um, something that I really forgot to touch on was once you've chosen your agent, make sure that the front shot of your building, if you can, if you're in a flat, flat sometimes this isn't possible, make sure that the first thing that buyers see is an attractive image. So if you're selling a house, make sure the front door looks smart. Perhaps consider some plant pots outside. You, know, you can always take them with you. You don't have to leave them there. But make sure you have the critical thing, curb appeal. And that will help you to maintain the best possible chance of getting the price as far as the outside is concerned. Now, inside, again, we must declutter, um, stage, present your home as nicely as you can. And that means not living it perhaps as you do, 
but trying to present an image of how they might live there. And that means first things first, depersonalize. Secondly, get rid of any smells, particularly if you have pets, open windows in the summertime and make sure that your house smells clean and fresh. Uh, we don't necessarily need to go to the degrees of making coffee or bread or anything like that as much as that's a common um, quote, but making your house smell pleasant is certainly helpful. And obviously clean, uh, that's really important too. If you have lots of pots and pans and things out in the kitchen and washing in the kitchen sink, it's not great. It's not ideal. Try and agree with your estate agent times when they can view the house, when you know you can prepare it for those viewings. So what we tend to do is say, right, can we borrow your house on these days at these times? So ahead of the people actually wanting to view, our clients have time to set up the house and do as they need to do, particularly if you're living there with a young family. It can be really difficult, of course. The other thing I would advise is in terms of pictures, make sure that any brightly colored toys particularly are stashed out of the way. And remember, you can utilize spaces such as lofts, cupboards, um, perhaps your shed. If you're using a shed, make sure that you wrap it in polythene and stand it off the floor, though. Um, and don't do that with electronic items. But, you know, it is well worth doing that. Um, so one of the most important things in all of this, of course, that we haven't mentioned yet is negotiation skills. And your estate agent should be good at this. And this is something they should be advising you on. Here at James Alexander, what we do is we advise sellers how best to handle negotiations. And that means largely for most people, the best thing you can do is step aside and let the professionals work. And let me explain why. It's pistols at dawn. You want to achieve the best possible price on your home. And that's right and proper. But guess what? The buyer looking at your home wants the best price for his family or her family. What's the best price for them? It's the lowest price. What's the best price for you? It's the highest price. You see the conflict. There's a natural conflict there. The estate agent is not impartial, but can be seen as more impartial as far as the buyer is concerned. They can have a more frank discussion and a good estate agent will look to be pragmatic and try and do a deal. Remember the estate agent on the one hand, they do want to protect their client and get the best possible price, but they also want to do a deal because that's how they eat. That's how they feed their families. So there's this constant conflict between the two and any good estate agent is a professional negotiator. And the art of professional negotiation is in seeing things from the other person's point of view. Um, and that's why it's really important that the estate agent, if they're good at their job, handles the negotiation. Quite often we see situations where buyers and sellers negotiate a deal ahead of the estate agent knowing about it. And then it can be very, very challenging later on down the road to get things like proof of deposit, proof of chain, only to find out in many cases that the deposit isn't there yet or it's coming from another source. Any good agent will be looking to check and double check any evidence that suggests that you have a deposit, for instance. We would, for instance, check the source of that deposit, that it's from a bona fide source and that it is liquid and available to the buyer so that we know that our client moving forward has a source of funds, which will mean that our vendor seller can move on with some confidence. Now, that's just the start of buying and selling, really. And I know that's a lot to take in, uh, especially second time around, because you have the two things together and timing the sale and purchase can be critical for both sides. And the bigger the chain, of course, the bigger the problem. Most people want to move on a Friday. Why do they want to move on a Friday? Because it gives them the weekend to settle into their new home and get ready for the next week. Um, but I would suggest that a good day to move is actually a Wednesday or a Thursday, if you can, and if the rest of the chain can accommodate this. Now, the reason is twofold. Number one, just lost the camera there. Okay, number one, the reason for the uh, move midweek is that if things go wrong, then it's easier to get contractors to help you with the things that have gone wrong in the property. Number two, people like removals companies will be more likely to be available midweek than they are at weekends and therefore may even be considerably cheaper than a move on a Friday. So that's well worth considering from that point of view. But if you're thinking of buying and selling, it is a challenge because it does involve the two sides of the transaction. Bear in mind your legal costs will go up as well. And it is very, very critical. I can't express strongly enough to get a good quality solicitor to help you with this because we often find that the solicitors are the things holding up the sales. Sorry, no offense meant to my solicitor colleagues and friends in the industry, but the reality is we've seen a dearth of very poor 
conveyance has come into the industry in the past few years and many of them are delaying sales massively by not returning calls not responding not returning emails not issuing draft contracts it's frankly disgraceful how many are doing that and this is because we're in a society where we value cheap above all else and i often get asked you know do you know a cheap good solicitor and i always say well i know a good one and i know a cheap one which one would you like it's much better to pay a bit more and get one that will actually react when you need them to react rather than rely on one that is cheap and effectively may end up costing you that very sale or purchase that you're keen on making. So I hope that's helpful to you today. Um, I just thought it was necessary to run over that because so often we get asked that question. Uh, we'll be back next week with another edition of the Property Buyer and Sellers podcast. Until then, look after yourselves and if you can, your family and your friends. Ciao. Thank <laughs> you.